Suzanne Lucas is the evil HR lady. After a decade in corporate HR, she embarked on a new mission to enhance the world of work for all. She coaches and trains HR departments, speaks around the world, and is the mastermind behind the Evil HR Lady group on Facebook, which has become a community of more than 31,000 HR professionals. In this episode, we talked about the state of HR, the dangers of the idea and practice of bringing your whole self to work, and the value of improv comedy for developing leadership skills. Stay tuned to hear Chris and I try a bit of improv in this thought-provoking and fun episode with Suzanne Lucas. Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. Suzanne Lucas, welcome to the Indigo Podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. I have been familiar with Suzanne Lucas, also known as the Evil HR Lady, for several years now. And, um, well, let's just get right into it. Why are you called the Evil HR Lady? Isn't it obvious by now? (laughs) (laughs) So I came up with that name um, way back in 2006 when I started my blog because I was working in pharma, which is a rather conservative industry, and blogs were a new thing. And now they seem like a quaint old thing, but um, they were a new thing. And I needed the pseudonym because I knew I couldn't write under my real name. And when you think about HR, um, if you get called into your boss's office, and there's the the HR lady sitting there. How's that conversation gonna go? <laughs> oh man! And it's <laughs> exactly. probably it's probably preceded by an email that says, "Hey, see me in my office exactly. with no contact." Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what the deal is. So um, people have a negative perception of HR. So I play off of that. Like the evil HR lady. They do indeed. Uh, why do you think that is? Why do you, because it certainly taps into a stereotype of, of HR as a business function. Uh, just given your experience, why do you think that that stereotype, that idea persists? Well, there is, you know, the one thing is, you know, what I said in my funny little example, if you come into the office and the HR lady is waiting for you, you know, it's going to go poorly. HR delivers bad news. We get blamed for the bad news. People get mad at HR when they're like, oh my gosh, my raise was so terrible. That wasn't me. That was finance, man. They don't <laughs> want to determine the budget. We just parsed it out, you know? Um, nothing, nothing to do with HR, but so much of the stuff that HR does that people don't like are things that we don't have tremendous control over. Mm-hmm. Um you know, people are always getting their knickers in a twist about um, the EEOC questions on job applications. It's like that. We didn't come up with that. You can thank the federal government for that. Thank you very much. Um, you know, and we often enforce rules that we may not necessarily agree with ourselves, but they come down from on high. But part of the reason why people have a negative attitude towards HR is some HR people are terrible. They're (laughs) terrible people. And yes, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) And you heard it here from anyway, there are some terrible people out there in (laughs) HR. And then there are some completely nice people who are in over their heads because stupid companies think anybody can do HR. Mm. And so I see this all of the time. Um, I have a Facebook group. We have 31,000 HR people in it. And we'll get questions like this. You know, I'm the new director of HR for this startup. I've been in marketing my whole career. I don't know anything about HR. What should I know? Right. And it's like, there are literally thousands of HR people out there that would have loved to take in the job. Mm. Why did you choose to hire someone? with no HR experience. 
And then the companies are like, HR is worthless. Well, of course it's worthless. You hired a marketing person into HR. Why did, did you think that they were going to know what they were doing? Um, so part of it is on, you know, the CEO's head, but it's also an internal image thing that, that there's some terrible HR people. Sure. Sure. There are. There the, totally are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, straight for the jugular right at the top. But, but no that's also terrible a, HR people would dare listen to this podcast. Everyone listening is fabulous. Uh, exactly. Exactly. But if you have a if you have a child who's graduated and lost, maybe there's a career for <laughs> <laughs> that'll no. pay them more than they're worth in the wonderful field of HR. <laughs> no. Oh, goodness gracious, no. <laughs> uh, well, you know, since you mentioned your Facebook group, which I, I certainly would encourage folks to go out there and check out the, it's just called Evil HR Lady on Facebook. And like you said, it has 31,000. Actually, you sold yourself short. It's 31,063 as of this oh. morning, as of right now. So well, there you go. <laughs> uh, it's quite a large group. It's robust. It has uh, some vibrant commentary. There's funny memes. There's legit questions. There's a whole bunch of banter. And, and, and honestly, I think it's a, a nice way to, for me as an HR professor, um, at least that's one thing that I teach, you know, to, um, kind of keep a pulse on what people are actually wondering and thinking about. And I guess what I'd wonder from you is what have you kind of noticed? What are some of your observations over the years as you've had that group and just kind of watched everything go on? And I assume you probably have other people help moderating by, <laughs> by this point and so forth. But uh, what, what have you kind of learned from, or what if anything surprise you as that community has evolved? There's been a lot of surprises and I do have the world's best moderating team. A shout out to my mods. They are fantastic. Um, just brilliant HR professionals themselves and, and very funny people. You should see the memes we share behind the scenes. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, Watching, you know, the trends and things that happen, of course, there's calendar things, you know, right now we have open enrollment drama going on, but we're going to have open enrollment drama every fall. That's just part of open enrollment, right? Um, you know, through the pandemic, there's, I, I was so proud of the group during the pandemic because everything was changing all of the time. And so many companies had one HR person and two HR people. Um, and you're trying to keep everybody safe, follow all the CDC rules, follow all your state rules, um, do everything that you can, and you're alone at mm -hmm. it. And the group really turned into a one massive HR department with everybody supporting everybody else, everybody helping people work through. We have a bunch of employment lawyers in there. And especially during the pandemic, when people would be like, Hey, I don't understand this. They would pop right in and explain, this is how you implement this. This is what you need to do. You know, free of charge, you're getting lawyers that normally bill $600 an hour answering questions for people that they don't know for free. Wow. Um, and you had HR experts in there. You had, um, and everybody was just this really, really helpful group of people. And that's when I saw the best come out of HR. And that's also, you know, we talk about the evil side of HR. Um, also during that crisis, I saw HR professionals who genuinely cared about their employees and who were heartbroken at having to lay people off. Mm. Um, you know, we have this reputation of being cruel and heartless, but nobody was cruel and heartless. If, you know, if they had to lay people off, they were heartbroken. And again, that's not a decision made at HR's level that HR person should definitely be at the table helping make those decisions. But ultimately that is a CEO or president decision. Um, sure. We carried out. But I just saw incredible compassion and um, everybody working together to help people that they didn't know. Right, right. And, you know, as you were describing that, it, it just brought home to me and kind of reminded me of the fact of how many people out there, 
if you're in the world of HR and, you know, maybe you're in, there are many small companies out there. And if, unless you have, you know, more than generally, you know, a hundred people or more, you're probably not going to have more than one or two HR people uh, in the whole organization. And so it can be kind of a lonely thing for those folks. And so it seems like perhaps your group is um, providing some, um, fulfilling some of that need for, not for connection, for commiseration, and also for genuine advice. Absolutely. It absolutely does all of those things. Um, you know, so many of our group members are HR departments of one or two or three. And, you know, I I came up in HR through big companies. Um, and so, um, you know, we had three or 400 HR people. Right. And everybody had a single task. You know, this is what you do. You do employee relations and nothing else. You do HRIS and nothing else, right? Um, and and so there was always a subject matter expert that I could call. You know, if something came up, there was always somebody that was specialized in that field. But in smaller companies, you have to know everything. Mm -hmm. And that's a really tough, tough thing to do. It sure is. It sure is. Uh, you know, one other thing that crosses my mind, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this, just as someone in the edu education world, you know, are there things that you have thought or what are you, I guess, just your general take on HR education? You know, are there things perhaps that we should be teaching more of, uh, less of <laughs> out there? If someone's getting, I mainly teach in a master's program in HR, and um, I'm always trying to stay in touch with what's really going on. Well, as I said, one of the big problems in HR is hiring people who have no business being in HR leadership roles and HR mm. leadership roles. Um, this happens all of the time, especially in the startup world, because they're like, hey, yeah, we need we a position for my college roommate. We're going to put him in there. Um, <laughs> it's fine <laughs> to hire someone without experience into an entry level role. That's the idea of an entry level role, right? We're going to bring you in. We're going to train you. My first HR job was as an HR admin in the compensation department. Um, and I learned a ton. Um, but you shouldn't put me in as the the director of compensation, you know, which we see happening. Um, so that's a big concern is that there are people in these leadership roles that don't know. Mm -hmm. But for students, um, one of the things, um, Robin Schooling, who is an HR guru, talks about this. She talks about real HR, trench HR, she calls it, and conference HR. And conference HR is always like, what's the workplace of the future going to be like? <laughs> and, and trench HR is, oh my gosh, someone is smearing poop on the bathroom walls again. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's so, getting real. It's, it's getting, getting real here. Real. Um, <laughs> Robin worked for years at a casino in cas uh, casino HR. And you can imagine her stories. You should have her on if you haven't had her on before. Um, <laughs> just she's got stories because that's real life. HR. And there's also a huge distinction between white collar HR and blue collar HR. Mm. And we often see that battle in the Facebook group um, that the two sides can't see where the other person is coming from. And um, it's because it's, it's entirely different types of people, groups of people. Not one is not better than the other. It's just different. And so giving people some ideas about the trenches, like what's really out there. I mean, if you're dealing with master's degrees, hopefully most of them have had some experience, but some of them have probably come straight from undergrad, in which case they don't have any experience other than their part-time campus job. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that reality check. Um, and then so much with legal compliance, uh, mm. that's an area that a lot of people are lacking in. The, the problem is they don't know that they're lacking. So they're real confident in wrongness. Ooh, that's even worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. So what is what are a couple things that, you know, it's the idea of that bridge between HR and everybody else in an organization or in the world of work. What would you want some non-HR folks to take away 
I mean, you're exposed to so many HR practitioners and you're like, hey, listen, if, if just people in the world of work knew this, the world, their world and HR practitioners world would be a lot better place. The first thing is, is that most HR people do genuinely care about their employees. Um, they, they do genuinely care. They do genuinely want things to be better, but they are also overwhelmed. Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, like I said, there's a, a lot of government compliance stuff that, that you have to do. Um, processing paperwork has to be done. Uh, and all that stuff takes time. Plus you're dealing with, with problems. So I would want people to know that most people genuinely care. And the other thing is that HR is not your enemy. There's so many people, I see this all the time on like TikTok. Of, Here's the secret that you, uh, you know, that, you know, HR is out to get you and they just want to write you. We don't want to, we don't want to fire you. We're desperately trying to improve our employee retention. We, <laughs> we want to save you, you know, if, if I'm bringing you in and talking to you, it's because I want to save you. I'm trying to help you be successful in your job. I don't want to fire you. I will fire you. I have no qualms against firing anybody. That's that evil part. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to. And actually, last week I was at a, a conference in Connecticut. And they were talking about how in Connecticut, for every... Um, 1.5 jobs out there, there is one candidate. And so they were talking about the problem of desperately trying to retain people. Sure. Um, because they, they, they can't afford to lose someone because then they'll, they'll uh, not be able to replace them. And so the amount of work that that goes into and the amount of coaching and all of that, there really is, is that the other thing is that, People often assume, oh, you're just going to do what the company wants. Well, yeah, you're going to report up to the CEO eventually and and the CEO's word is law and, and you can't override. But you don't see the battles that go on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. We may be we, in public support whatever the leadership decision was, but you didn't see those meetings where we were advocating for the employees, you know. We're not the ones saying, oh, let's only have one week of vacation. We're not saying that. Um, but if that comes down with the decision, yeah, we're going to enforce that rule because that's our role. But it mm -hmm. wasn't our choice. It wasn't the mean HR lady that said one week of vacation. Um, we were advocating for six. <laughs> yeah. What, how many vacation weeks you want? All of them. <laughs> but you can't run an org that way. <laughs> right, exactly. We do have our limits. Um, we do have our limits. I'm strongly opposed to unlimited vacation, by the way. Yeah. Oh, man, we could go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> so one of the things that I like about the evil HR lady group that I've really enjoyed is I feel like LinkedIn has become a bit of a cesspool, honestly. <laughs> Anybody can just go out there and toot their horn. You'll get these feel-good memes that like are, are trash. And you know what? There have been a few in the evil HR group and people will call them out. They'll be like, this is not how the workplace works, which is something you don't see so much on LinkedIn where everybody's a thought leader because they typed it in to their description that they're a thought leader. Oh, like on LinkedIn when they're like, oh, I hired this person with absolutely no experience, but it turned out that they were the best person ever. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, Hire for attitude, not skills. Right. <laughs> right. And it, while I fully agree you can train anybody sure. to do just about anything, those things take time. Yep. And none of those thought leaders are ever like, I hired someone with no skills, and here is the process that we had to go through to get them up to speed. Mm. They're just like, I hired this person off the street. They were homeless, so I was compassionate. And now they're my vice president. Okay, but. That's a great story if it was true, which it's not. Um, but what happened in the middle? But you don't know because you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. All right, here, let's, th let's chew on this one. Uh -oh. Bring <laughs> your whole self to work. 
right? This is a meme that you'll see, and I don't fully know what that means. Um, but yeah, let's let's chew on that one. That is something that I rail against quite frequently. Please do not bring your whole self to work. Um, your whole self is perhaps lazy, perhaps self-centered, perhaps likes to sit on the couch and eat Ben and Jerry's directly out of the carton, which is the only way to eat Ben and Jerry's, by the way. I it's, mean, you know, one carton, one serving, <laughs> right? Amen to that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that, that is facts. <laughs> that is facts. Absolutely. Yeah. I saw something like, here's the idea. And they turn it upside down and cut it into four pieces. I'm like, what are you doing? You don't cut it into four pieces. You get a spoon. You eat it. Anyway. <laughs> Why am I overweight? I don't understand. Anyhow, <laughs> we don't, you want to bring your best self to work. And, and um, one of the things I talk about um, with, I use improv comedy as leadership development. Mm -hmm. um, and in improv, you can change who you are on a dime, right? And, and I talk about there, it doesn't matter what your emotion is at the moment, you need to project whatever image you need to project. So if, if I'm going into a meeting with somebody scary who I'm really nervous about, I can go in as, as myself being nervous and, you know, fidgeting with my hair or, or, you know, sitting all folded up in fetal position in the corner or whatever, because that's how I'm feeling at the moment. Or I can say, I feel like that, but I'm going to sit up straight. I'm going to, you know, keep my hands in front of me on the table. I'm, um, I'm going to keep my voice steady and I'm going to wear a scarf because when I'm nervous, my neck turns red. So if I wear a scarf then you can't see that my neck is red, thankful it's just my neck and not my face. Um, you know, and I'm going to do those things. There's times when you terminate someone where you're really happy to see that person go because they're a terrible person, but you're never going to conduct a termination where you're like, woohoo, it's time for you to go. You failed your parent. I'm so glad. Um, <laughs> and there also is a time when you're terminating someone and you're incredibly upset. You don't want to be terminating them. Um, you know that it's going to be really difficult on them and their families and you want to cry, but you don't do that either because it's not about you. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a CEO that posted yep. his crying video. It did not go over well because he was bringing his whole self to work. And instead of focusing on the employees, you know what? Firing people is hard. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. And when you're laying people off who are being terminated for no fault of their own, it's emotionally devastating for the person conducting the layoff, but it's not about you. Don't bring your whole self, bring your professional self who is doing your professional job. And when you get home, you cry about it. Or after the person leaves your office, you can shut your door and cry about it, but you're not going to cry during that meeting because it's not about you. You know, I think this is so important, um, the right behavior for the right time. And I think um, it was an interview, I think it was with Paul Bloom. Are you familiar with Paul Bloom? The name sounds familiar, but. He's like a psychologist that deals with like child developmental stuff and morality and stuff. But I remember he had this per really compelling story about you're in a brand new set of clothes, real expensive set of shoes, and you're walking to dinner. And you see a child drowning in knee deep water, right? So it's not like if you're going to rescue them, there's any chance of you drowning. Does it matter how you feel in that moment? Like right. you could be like, I can't believe this kid. Ah, or I hate the fact that I'm about to ruin my suit and shoes. But the right behavior is to reach in. Like it really doesn't matter how you feel about things because our our internal psyche is a ocean of changing mixed motivations, all kinds of weird emotions. But what, what matters is that you do the right thing for that right, right moment. Exactly. And, and that's, that's how you lead your teams, right? Like you may be having a hard time at your personal life, right? Or you may know that a bunch of people are going to be laid off like you're talking about, and you've got to change 
how you do things. Now, let's talk about how do we operationalize that sentiment in a work community. If you're an HR practitioner or somebody in the workplace, if you want to get that idea of, you know, how do we stop the authenticity at work madness that seems to be so rampant? I think the most important thing to do is to tell people. And that might seem, you know, so basic, but um, this is not about, well, this is about bringing your whole self to work. One of the things that I am a huge fan of and that people hate is dress codes. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of dress codes. And the reason why I'm a huge fan of dress codes is because it sets the standard before there's a problem. And people always say to me, well, I just hire, I hire adults, so I don't need to tell them what's appropriate and what's not. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you've never worked in HR, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and that's great in theory, but we also talk about diversity, right? And, um, and so if I am raised by two white collar parents, I mean, I guess I was raised by one white collar and one pink collar because my mom is a nurse. Um, so she wore scrubs. Um, but, um, you know, I saw my dad go to work every day in a button down shirt. Um, and um, I learned that growing up in that. Right. I that's like it was easy. All my friends, parents did the same thing. You know, that that was my environment. So I entered the workforce knowing how to dress because I was raised that way. But if you come from a blue collar household or um, or some other situation from a different culture or whatever, and then you're plopped into the workforce, and you're plopped into a white collar job. Um, do, do you know how to dress? And it's not because you're a bad person. It's just that you didn't grow up with it. You didn't experience it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so having a dress code that says this, 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 and this are, are our standards. That's a kindness. That's a kindness. Uh, no, it's not appropriate for you to wear midriff bearing clothes to the office. It's not. I mean, maybe if you have an office that you do you, whatever your office wants, go for it. But for most businesses, that's not appropriate. All you need to do is tell people. But if you don't, then you have this awkward conversation when your your new employee comes in with her um, stomach hanging out. And then she's like, you're sexist. Why are you looking at my stomach? Um, it's because I'm overweight. You would let a skinny girl wear this, you know, and you go this whole thing and you have no written documentation that says, keep your, your, I always say your boobs, butt and belly need to be covered, right? Those are those three areas. They have to be covered. If you just had that, then it's like, no, it's not you. Here it is. We don't allow the men to do it either. Right. This is definitely trenches HR realness <laughs> happening here. And it's not just about dress code stuff. No. These norms are scripts for success. I have a friend of mine that just started a new job. And one of the things, um, she's in a pretty senior role. She has meetings all through the day. And so normally she eats. Like she'll eat during a meeting because she didn't get a break for lunch on some days. Right. And she's looking around and she just said, hey, does anybody not eat lunch around here? And several of the people on her team did. I, actually, I don't eat lunch at work. And like simple norms of like, hey, at lunchtime, people normally eat within this. We don't allow eating in our conference rooms or whatever. There's all kinds of norms. It's not just about getting dressed. But if people know what those norms are. They're documented and you talk about them, then you can feel really comfortable not sticking out like a sore thumb in ways you don't want to. Exactly. And trying to learn just by osmosis and watching is is OK. You can learn those things, but um, but it's so much easier if you say, yeah, OK, 
uh, you know, we don't eat in the conference rooms. People don't take their lunch there. Or, hey, you can eat at your desk or you can gather in the conference room or or whatever your rule is. It doesn't matter what the rule is. Just let people know. It's a kindness. You know, we call everybody by their first names here, except for the CEO who, are, who we refer to as Mr. Jones. Um, it just... I remember that transition. Actually, the transition for me happened when I went to graduate school. I went to graduate school straight from undergrad. And the professors were all like, hi, I'm Jeff. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're Dr. Siegel. Like, because in my undergraduate, we called everybody doctor or professor. I would have never called anybody by their first name. But in graduate school, they're like, well, yeah. but they let us know. So there wasn't that awkward what have I called this person? You know, it was, hi, you know, we, we go by our first names with the graduate students. The undergraduates call us professor, but the grad students call us by our first names. Yeah. I think that's really great. And I think those are good examples of simple ways, yet not unimportant ways in which HR can have a big influence on culture in an organization, right? Through those, yeah. through those policies, those norms, um, and being in the trenches doing those types of things. You know, a little earlier, you mentioned your interest and your expertise in improv and improv comedy as an HR leadership tool and so forth. So I'd like to maybe shift our attention there and tell us a little bit more about that, because that sounds really interesting and perhaps a little bit different than some of the other things that we've done on this podcast thus far. Well, um, improv comedy is such a funny thing because um, it, it it's all about communication and about relating to those people around you. You know, if, if I do a stand up routine, I'm going to get up on the stage and I'm going to talk about my childhood trauma and try to make it funny. Right. That's what stand up comedians do. But an improv comedian, they work with the audience to then make fun of the audience's childhood trauma. So, um, that was that was a joke. Don't <laughs> don't bring that trauma to work. Both of you have these looks on your face. It's like, oh my gosh. What is she no, we're we're Suzanne. Whatever ride you're on, we want to get on that bus. It's uh, fun. It, it's so <laughs> don't, don't flat. Okay. Um, but it's all about communication because most of the time when we're talking with someone, we spend most of our time in the conversation thinking about what we're going to say next. Yep. And that works out fine because it's a logical flow. There's no logic in improv. Like there's no logical flow. Anything can happen. And because of that, you have to learn to pay really close attention to your team members and to the audience. And you can't just assume what's going to happen next. You cannot assume that it's going to follow the path. So, you know, we're doing an improv scene and, you know, typically in a two person improv scene, the audience will give a suggestion of a person, place or a relationship. So they give us, uh, you know, a place. So they're like Paris. And so in my head, I'm like, oh, well, this is going to be, you know, a romantic scene in Paris. Um, and my scene partner is like, this is going to be, um, you know, the obnoxious Frenchman who is is criticizing the American tourist. You don't get a chance to talk before. So I have in my head, it's romance. My scene partner has in his head that it's going to be the, you know, the obnoxious Frenchman criticizing the obnoxious American tourist because American tourists are obnoxious. And I don't think <laughs> that is an American tourist. Um, whichever one of us speaks or acts first, starts that and the other person has to change on a dime, right? Um, and then, so even Mr. Obnoxious Frenchman, he starts first and he's like, pardon, why are you here in my country? Why are you not, that's not a French accent, I don't speak French. Um, <laughs> you know, why don't you speak French, you terrible tourist? And I can then respond, um, you know, oh, you're so beautiful. Um, I, can Can we have a, a drink together and now i'm trying to make it a romantic scene and he's got his stuff you know there's you you have to pay attention to what's going on learning that skill is so valuable for all leaders but especially for hr people mm. 
Um, because with HR people, we're not supposed to go in with preconceived notions, especially when we're conducting an investigation. You know, I need to to go in with an open mind. So I need to listen to everything that you're saying before I formulate my answer. So that's one of those skills. So, so this is something that's appearing in the workplace. But what I don't know, because I, I know some people that do this, um, definitely you've brought it up, is how does an organization benefit from this? Or if you're an individual thinking, well, you know, I want to do better stuff in my life. Why would, why would an org, let's take it first from the org perspective. Why would an org possibly want to bring improv comedy in into as part of their maybe learning and development type function or something like that? What, what would, Right. Improv on that. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> I don't have to improv on that. I'm prepared. Um, I mean, of course, this is pure improv. One of the things that companies are always trying to do is build teams. And they try to do it in this artificial way of, you know, tell, you know, two truths and a lie. Um, you know, tell us about it. Everybody go around and tell their most embarrassing moment. Um where you're trying to force people to share a part of themselves with people they don't necessarily want to share a part of themselves, right? Um, and it makes it every everything uncomfortable. When you do that whole two truths and a lie and everyone's got to come up with these amazing things um, and you feel this pressure, like, oh gosh, everybody else's truths were, you know, I was, you know, parasailing and I don't know, where does one parasail? Cancun, I don't know, do you parasail in Cancun? I've never been. Um, and, you know, and you're like, all I've done is gone to Walmart and gone grocery shopping. And I went to the local university. Like, I don't have these exotic experiences. And so then you start to feel this pressure. The thing about improv is it allows you to build team membership and to build trust with one another without forcing anybody to share anything personal. Mm. And you can build a really tight knit team without knowing people's childhood trauma. You really can. And improv is one of those things that helps you do it. Because like I said, you have to learn to trust your, um, trust your uh, team members. And one of the, one of the games that I do, it's called rescue me. And in this game, um, you're standing in a circle and one person sit, stands into the circle and starts to sing any song. All right. And if you're a terrible singer, it's fine. You can just speak the words. Um, although it's funnier if you sing them. But anyway, the idea is all of us know thousands of songs, the first two lines of thousands of songs. And then we're we're pretty dead after those first two songs. You can start out really, <laughs> you are the dancing queen. And then you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so the idea is that somebody else jumps in and rescues you before you run out of lyric. Um, oh, I love that. That's fun. And it's super fun and everybody ends up laughing. And actually, anytime anybody does start it on an ABBA song, it tends to have everybody else just join in singing that song because they're so fun to sing. Um, but it's this jump in and save you, jump in and save you. Um, and when you do things like this, you're you're learning how to to trust your coworkers to come in and save you. And you're learning to to jump in and trust and, and save other people. And you're also learning this valuable principle of failing with joy because mm. it's hilarious. Everybody fails. Nobody knows all the words to any song. This is what I have learned from doing this game. Um, you know, maybe I'm a little teapot. We all got that down, but um, everybody starts singing and doesn't know where to go anymore. And, um, and, and it's okay. Everybody laughs because it's funny and, and you can build this team relationship without having to to you know make this fake vulnerability um, it's just fun now of course there are people that hate it i'm not saying that improv is the be all end all for everybody because there are people that would be incredibly uncomfortable and the point of team building is not to make people incredibly uncomfortable uh, that's what performance reviews are for so um <laughs> <laughs> good one uh yeah but you know things like that are really helpful in building a team it's yeah. really helpful to to build that trust with one another yeah and just a 
bunch of things that you said, I think really resonated with me. And one of them um, is, you know, this idea of being able to build a relationship without, uh, you know, being over uh, disclosive of personal details and stuff like that. And it reminds me, there's actually some um, some people in the, the scholarly world who have have kind of come up with a name for that, and they call it non disclosive intimacy, right? And ah, so, whoa. right, so yeah, you can take that one, but and, and it co- actually comes from an article all about jazz musicians, right? Doing non disclosive intimacy, right? And so, um, jazz musicians when they are jamming, right? They all first of all, in order to jam um, effectively, and Chris is way more of a musician than I am, uh, so you can refute or, or uh, corroborate this. Um, you have to have a certain level of skill, right? So there has to be some skill involved. There are rules for how it works right. in jazz. Like there's there's structure for music, um, but there's this idea that you can um, you can work together um, in this you know way where you're building trust. Uh, you're not having to necessarily disclose um, lots of things about yourself, but you are working together in a, you know, what we could consider maybe an intimate type of relationship because you have that, that you're, you're all on the same page, right? Um, in, in terms of what you're doing. So uh, I think that that in any context of, of a team um, could be very helpful. And, and I love what you said about rules. Um, you know, we often talk about thinking outside of the box. Well, the box actually serves a purpose. Yeah. Um, And it gives those rules so that people feel comfortable. And um, the box can also increase your creativity. You know, if you had jazz musicians with no rules, you wouldn't get beautiful music out of it. Um, Precisely. You would get terrible, terrible music. And the same thing is true with, with improv. We have rules and we practice and we have structure. I had a, a terrible experience, um, a couple of stand-up comedians invited our improv troupe to, to do a show with them. And we said, sure, you know, we, we'd love to come do a show. And we did the first hour and, and we had the audience laughing and everything was great. And then these two stand-up comedians get up and instead of doing stand-up, they said, we're also going to do improv, but they had no improv training. So they thought that improv was just making stuff up as you go. (laughs) <laughs> and it was so embarrassing. They were so awful. The audience was like getting up one by one and leaving. And we were crawling under our seats and dying because they had gotten rid of the box. And it mm-hmm. turns out that you need that box to be funny. Um, and and you need those boundaries and and knowing what's appropriate and what's not, which again gets back to the dress codes and the company norms and where do you eat lunch and what do you call people and all of those things just gives you that structure so that you can feel comfortable and be confident in what you're doing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i people that are new to this don't realize and i i my buddy tom that lives down the road has run a improv workshop for i don't know 25 years or something It's a long time. And that guy is still a student of improvisation. Right. Right. So when they, and I've gone to some of his workshops, they've been tremendous. They practice improvising. A jazz musician, like I play my undergrads in music, you, you practice so that you can improvise. And there's all kinds of stuff, like understanding that there's a story arc for a scene, you know, Like, if you start out too big, you might not have anywhere to build up to. Right. You know, um, if you don't acknowledge something, let's say a ceiling tile falls in between you during a scene, it would be really weird if you just ignored the ceiling tile. Right? Like, and these are things you would only know if you're practicing improvisation. And one of caveating that or adding to that, how's that relate to the workplace? So much of what we try to teach organizations is how to sense and respond appropriately, right? So, you know, you may have learned one way to lead a team, but have you checked in with your team to see if that type of leadership works for them? Right. You can, we see um, executive derailment, right? We see executives derail because they can't sense the situation 
And to your point, I think improv helps teach what can an org get from this? Well, do you want your guys to not be automatons that run a script, but actually sensing vibrant, lively people that engage meaningfully with their workforce and their team members and keyword respond appropriately versus just bringing their whole self to work? <laughs> This is what you get when you improv. Yeah. Well, what's what's kind of coming to my mind is first of all, I feel out of the the three of us, I feel like that I am the one who maybe is least familiar with improv, even though I've I've seen it done. Uh and but that's that's pretty much the extent of it. I wonder if maybe we should kind of give our audience a little bit of an example of what that might look like. Um, I, I don't know if you'd want to maybe try leading us through that, Suzanne. This is terrifying for me to even suggest. That's improv and improv, huh? <laughs> All right, I'm not going to make you sing. <laughs> Although I did do a little bit of ABBA, so... You, know. you did. Um, <laughs> <She's>... <laughs> <clears throat> I am definitely a singer. No, I'm not a singer. Um, okay. We're going to do a game. This is an improv game, but um, it's specifically to teach a skill. And... So it's called headlines. And what we're going to do is we're going to give headlines. And, but here's the thing, we're going to go in a little circle. And, but your headline has to begin with the last word of the previous person's headline. Mm. So if I say, you know, schools are closed due to a snow day, you have to start with day. Or if I'm feeling generous, you can start with snow day. Hmm. Um, and you can you can throw in an article if you need to, an A, an and a the, something. But you're, you're, that's your restriction. That's your box. Okay. All right. You guys ready? I, I guess so. All right. What's your, all right, Ben, Suzanne, you'll go first, right? Then Ben, then me. Does that, does that, that work? Works. Okay. Uh, so all right. I will give you a, a headline. Um, Politician charged with corruption. Corruption leads to untimely death of Florida man. Ooh. Man, I really don't understand these time changes, said everyone born in the last 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> um. Years of study complete, and we have new information on hedgehog behavior. <laughs> uh, um, behavior of teenagers bewilders even teenagers themselves. Oh, that's a tough one to wow. start with, Chris. <laughs> Ooh, <then. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> themselves the radical new pronoun pushed by gender ideologists frustrates hr compliance everywhere <laughs> I, f I feel like a child amongst some pros here goodness sakes that was a thing of beauty okay uh, I think we can end on that, that. Yeah, I, scene, we're done scene. we're done that was good See, and that's fun. That's the type of thing that you do. There's, and you'll notice that every single one of us had a pause mm -hmm. before, but in this conversation, we haven't had big pauses. That's because we are all thinking about what we're going to say before it's our turn to say. Mm. But when you're doing that game, you can't. Yeah, you cannot figure out what you're going to say next because you don't know what your first word is. Right. And, you know, I think it's really interesting, too, is just kind of the emotional and cognitive experience of it. So when I hear the last word that you're saying, then I'm trying to immediately think about and pausing a little bit. But I have to kind of recenter myself a little bit and think and not freak out. Like, and I think these are really valuable skills just for not even public speaking, but just um, interaction in general. It's um, yeah, there's a lot going on there. It is just for interaction in in general, and it can be applied in so many points of your life. And I, I'm a bit of a drama queen, so I'm going to share my dram dramatic filled life. Um, 
before I was going into court for my divorce, um, I was sitting in the court waiting room and I was texting my friend and improv coach. And she's like, okay, you're not Suzanne. You are a character. And so she's like, this is how you're going to sit. This is how you're going to respond. And then the whole thing, anytime my uh, beloved ex-husband's attorney was like saying all this nasty stuff about me, um, it was bizarre. Anyway, you know, I felt myself wanting to die. I was just like, no, that's, she's talking about someone else. I am this confident, you know, woman who is sitting up straight and who is, you know, not crawling under her seat. Mm. Um, it was a very, having someone say to me and giving me permission essentially to, to take on a persona um, rather than, you know, be myself and have to face the, you know, the emotional attacks. Um, it was a really handy, a handy tool. And, um, you know, anytime you're going through something stressful, get a, get a persona, you know, this is how I'm going to react. This is how this person would react. Mm. Yeah. I, I've done this in executive coaching sessions and I yes. can't tell you how many people have said this is being fake. Mm -hmm. And one, we want to say, do you really know yourself? Is it truly possible to know yourself? And like all these deep, like meta type ideas, maybe not, but being like, we're talking about being the right self that is needed in the moment is super, super important. This idea of, um, that somehow your authentic authenticity is required is this idea of we talk about pro social behaviors, right? And these are behaviors that you don't just say whatever you think, like, I don't know, the proverbial um, Tourette's type person where you just like, that would not make a workplace that might be the best. Right. Um, and you say the things that help you get along because you have some kind of organizational mission. Like I'm here to process payroll. I don't like that you eat Funyuns at your desk at lunch because Funyuns smell horribly. But this in the true. name of in the name of keeping things chill, so we can process payroll, maybe I don't say something, and I I kind of take one for the team on on that to an extent. Um, these are things that makes the world better. The deeper is anybody who's been right, you know, sorry to hear about your divorce. Maybe it was a positive thing. I don't know all the details, but anybody that's been in a relationship with somebody for a long enough time, the more you know about them, the deeper things go, the more you can have conflict around senses of self. Yes. And the workplace is the last place you want to have sense of self conflict. It, it needs to be like, hey, are we going to debut product X or Y? That's something worth maybe arguing about in the or workplace and, you know, advocating your position. But these other things, man, it's going to slow down getting work done a lot, right? Yes, mm. yes. And this is one of those things when companies allow like Slack channels to talk about all sorts of different things, which is great. I have no problem with that. But when you start getting into politics and such, and then you have people not willing to work with each other because they have different political views. Mm. And it's like, no, we just got to decide how we're going to market the product. Um, you know, it doesn't matter who you voted for. The the thing is, it's your behavior, but you build these, these things where people are, are angry at each other for things that are unrelated to work. You don't want to do that. Um, yeah, so. you know, this is all fascinating. And, I, uh, you know, there's a, a whole social science literature around acting uh, in the workplace. Um, and there are kind of two different ways that it's oftentimes discussed. One being surface acting where you, um, you know, are maybe you say, I'm going to act this way at a superficial level. Um, you know, I'm not going to actually feel the emotion. I'm going to pretend as if I am feeling the emotion and I'm in this role. Or there's what we call deep acting where you, it's like, I'm going to really take this on. I'm actually going to believe it. And there are kind of some different implications for those two different approaches uh, in the workplace. But I just think it's it's a really interesting area. And I encourage anybody out there who's kind of, you know, we have a lot of uh, researcher types who are interested in these types of things. 
to um, you know, go ahead and uh and look up those those different ideas around surface and deep acting. So um and it kind of ties into that where we where we started on this idea of authenticity and what you're bringing your to work um you know be it your whole self or your best self right and i would tend to suggest that your your thoughts around the best self make a lot of sense absolutely all right so let's bring this in for a landing normally we talk about implications for individuals leaders and organizations writ large so as we've looked at what we talked about today what are three principles that people could take away from our discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have the quiz. Yeah. To... Nobody told me there was going to be a quiz. <laughs> Three things to take away. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing is to don't be your authentic self at work, be the appropriate self for the situation. And then on that same vein, um, it's okay to act like you want to be instead of um, instead of you know being your truthful self. Um, you know, you may want to tell the the CEO that he's a horrible person, um, but it's not going to go over well and it's not going to solve any problems. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey boss, you stink. What? I'm just bringing my whole self to work, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm just being honest with you. Um, and, and the third one, I, I'm going to uh, steal uh, the non-disclosive intimacy. You can build a great team based on non-disclosive intimacy. Yeah. And and some of these principles that you brought up in terms of using improv seem to have a lot of application there. So I really appreciate that. Um, tell our listeners where they might find out more about you. Well, um, you can read my blog at www.evilhrlady.org. If you are an HR professional, you can join the Evil HR Lady Facebook group. If you are not an HR professional, sorry, you're not allowed. Um, we love you, but it's not for you. Um, you can also follow me on LinkedIn, where I promise to never end a post with agree. <laughs> yeah, tell tell us what you really think about this, even though you're not an expert. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> agree. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne. Really appreciate it. Thank you for being a part of the Indigo Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.